Hello, everybody. This is the Cincinnati Herald podcast. I am your host, John Alexander Reese, digital editor of the Cincinnati Herald. The Cincinnati Herald has been around since 1955 and is the largest African American newspaper in the greater Cincinnati area. I would also like to introduce my guests for today, Circulation Director Wade Lacey Sr. How are you doing today, Wade? Everything is great. Good to hear, good to hear. And I would like to also introduce intern Zoe Becker. How are you doing, Zoe? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I am doing fantastic. I also want to introduce special guest, Dr. Anissa Shomo, who will be talking to us about the COVID-19 vaccination. Hi, thank you for having me. No problem at all. Now, before we dive into the main topic of the day, let's quickly talk about a couple of other news items. Firstly, the legendary film, television, and stage actress, Cicely Tyson, who earned an Academy Honorary Award, three Emmys, and a Tony, died this past Saturday at the age of 96. In 1963, Tyson made history with East Side, West Side, becoming the first Black lead in a television drama series. She also got an Academy Award nomination for the 1972 film, Sounder. Tyson also had a recurring role on the popular TV series, How to Get Away with Murder. She will definitely be missed. Secondly, the African American Chamber of Commerce, in participation with UC Economic Center, did a study which shows that Greater Cincinnati Black businesses had a $1.4 billion economic impact. This is the first study in the nation by a Chamber of Commerce to quantify the economic impact of Black businesses. These businesses directly employ over 8,000 people with $540 million in earnings throughout the Cincinnati Metropolitan Statistical Area. And finally, it was discovered that there was material from an extremist group that appeared on Xavier University's campus. Material from a group that advocates extremist ideologies and hate speech was placed in public areas around Xavier's campus, according to a spokesperson from the university. Xavier did not confirm the name of the group associated with the flyers and materials that they discovered, but Thomas More College and Northern Kentucky University reported that the finding materials were from the white supremacist group Patriot Front on their campuses earlier this week. In a statement released Monday, Father Graham, president of Xavier University, said that university officials also believe the group, while on campus, destroyed a sign outside Bellamere Chapel that read, racism is a sin. Black Lives Matter. Now I want to turn it over to you, Wade. Which story uh, impacted you the most? Actually, I'm going to say the Cicely Tyson, uh, uh, Delta Cicely Tyson. Uh, she's been along, she had been with, with us for so long. Uh, very talented person, uh, personality. Uh, I think that most people uh, felt that she was family. Even though she was a celebrity, they just felt like she was family. So I think that was the biggest impact. Although the Xavier University issue uh, brings up again the the issue where, where we are now trying to, I think, pacify by calling them extremists. And I think the word is the white supremacy or white su supremacist. That's a more of an accurate term to use for them because I think the just saying they're extremists kind of uh, pacifies their their whole outlook. Agreed. Zoe, which story hit you the hardest this week? So I'm in college right now. So definitely the Xavier story um, just really disturbed me. I mean, I just hate to see that at colleges where students are trying to learn how to be functioning adults in society. And it's really great that there was a, a, a statement issued so quickly. But I mean, this kind of stuff happens all the time at universities and it's not always as reported on in the media. So I think it's really important to pay attention to the next steps that will be taken against these groups. Definitely. Dr. Shomo, which story intrigued you the most? I actually was um, interested in the story about the economic impact um, from the African-American Chamber. I'm a member of the African-American Chamber. Um, so I hadn't heard that story and it's really, you know, one of the biggest things that we talk about when we talk about how the COVID-19 crisis has really hit hit African-American community really hard. And a lot of it has to do with the economics of it. People still having to go to work and trying to make it and 
you know, health insurance disparities, all that sort of stuff. Um, so that, that story was the one that I, um, that stuck out the most to me. Definitely. So that's the news wrap up for this week. Now I want to uh, dive into the main topic of this week's podcast, and that is the COVID-19 vaccination. So Dr. Shomo, um, please give us an in-depth um, look into this COVID-19 vaccine. Well, um, so right now we have three vaccines that are approved for emergency use. Actually, let me take that back. We have two vaccines that are approved for emergency use, which are the Pfizer mRNA vaccine and the Moderna mRNA vaccine. There is a Johnson & Johnson vaccine. It was recently um, had the study data released. So they are applying for emergency use from the FDA, but it has not been approved yet as far as I know, um, but should be coming soon. And that, that study um, is an interesting one because it's not as effective as the other two vaccines that are already out there. Um, but definitely, we don't have enough vaccines. Um, so it could be a good option for people who are lower risk. Um, it did a pretty good job of preventing severe COVID, 85%, but it didn't do as good of a job uh, of preventing um, symptomatic COVID, even the mild and the moderate, like the other vaccines did. Um, so it was 66% effective at mild and moderate, prevention of disease, 85% effective at preventing severe disease, but the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines are 95% effective at preventing um, any kind of symptomatic COVID. So they both require two, two doses. Um, we are still running into shortages a lot. So it's just um, having more vaccine, any kind of vaccine is gonna be helpful because we're dealing with this crisis. Um, so that's, I don't know if you want me to say any more than that, but I felt like that was a good Good update that just happened in the past week that the Johnson & Johnson data was released. No, that is a very good update. I do have a couple of questions about the vaccine, though. Mm -hmm. I know someone who's 70 years old. He signed up for the COVID-19 vaccine on the Cincinnati Board of Health website, and the vaccine was supposed to be available to him, you know, because he's 70 years older this past Monday. But he, when he checked the website, it said he could not get the vaccine at the time. Do you know when and where he can be able to get the vaccine? The issue that we're having right now is just having the doses available. Um, I know that, so the Hamilton County Board of Health has a website where you can go and register. And once your age group becomes eligible, um, then they will contact you if they are able to schedule an appointment. And so it's kind of like, you know, there is two different things that are going on. There is the, the governor, uh, Mike DeWine, has basically says when people are eligible. So this past week, it was 70 years of age and up. Um, next week, it's going to be 65 years and up. Um, so there's kind of a schedule of rollout for prior prioritizing older adults because they have been um, the highest, they have had the highest death rate. Um, so trying to, trying to, you know, allow them to get the vaccine before a lot of other people who have not had as high of death rates, um, just age-wise. So that was, you know, how the government tried to prioritize, um, you know, different groups. And the issue is just the supply. Um, there's a lot of issues with supplies. It's supply and demand, you know, mm -hmm. goes back to, to basic um, economics um, of supply and demand. So there's a good demand, which is good. You know, we want people to get right. the vaccine so that we can, so we can get back our economy and everything back on track. Um, but the problem right now is just we don't have enough doses. Um, so I work for UC, and so I will just give the phone number for UC because they have a pretty good process. They have a phone number that you can call whether you're a UC patient or not. The phone number is 513-584-DOSE, DOSE, like a dose of the vaccine. So that's 584-DOSE. Um, and they have been scheduling appointments. They have been doing the vaccines um, like a drive-through setup. Um, so I think that generally when people will register on the Hamilton County website, they send you a um, information on where you can get the vaccine. But some people are directly going, going directly to their hospitals where they already receive care or where they know they have the vaccine. So one thing that people can do if the Hamilton County um, information isn't 
as up to date is to call the hospitals directly to see if anyone has the doses. Um, and at UC, what they do when they are when they don't have doses, they suspend the phone lines um, <laughs> because you know they you know they don't want to spend a lot of time telling people all day that they're out of the vaccine. Um, so it's nice that they have set up a separate line. Um, but other hospitals, you just call the the main hospital and ask them about the COVID vaccine. So all the hospitals in the Cincinnati area, that's that's how they've been handling handling it. So another public health option where you can you know call to see if they have it available is the Cincinnati Health Department. Their phone number is 513-357-7462. So that is a separate number they have set up as well to try to help people um, get scheduled for the vaccine if they have a dose available. Definitely. And uh, Wei, do you have any questions about the COVID-19 vaccination process? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, Dr. Sh uh, Shomo, what would you say to the individuals uh, like myself who are mm, about to turn 65, and do not take the flu shot, uh, had concerns about the, the COVID shot, started to come around, so okay, this might be necessary. But in recent weeks, we've heard different uh, medical professionals speak of the possibility that the uh, COVID shot might be an annual thing. What, what would you tell us? Um, so there have been, a, there's been a lot of discussion in the past, I would say a couple of weeks about mutants, um, COVID mutant variants, basically that the virus is mutating rapidly um, and that this current vaccine that we have, you know, may be somewhat effective, but maybe not completely effective um, because of the way that the virus is mutating. I would say that we don't know the future, number one. So I would tell you that probably last March, none of us thought that we would be here where we are, um, waiting for a vaccine or even that a vaccine would be available this, this quickly. So I think that I, you know, I've gotten the vaccine, I've gotten both doses because I'm a healthcare professional, it was offered to me. And for me personally, um, I'm just not going to worry that far in the future. You know, I'm going to take it day by day as we've all been doing it. And right now, the way that the vaccine has been offered and the way that it's been studied is 95% effective against COVID. The way that the mRNA um, vac uh, vaccine was, was basically made or created, um, it should be able to cover the variants. So that's the thing. We don't know if it can cover the variants, but it should be able to cover them because the focus is on the spike protein and the spike proteins, they usually don't change that much. Um, and so that's the biggest thing about, you know, the, the field of immunology, we call it. They have a lot of different ways that they try to attack um, viruses. They try to attack their proteins or they try to attack um, different messages that they send. So they do all types of things to try to, to um, be able to, you know, produce that immune response that we need in our body to be able to fight the viruses off. That's the whole point of the vaccines. So for me personally, I know there's a lot of talk about, you know, how effective will it be, but we need to have an annual vaccine. We don't know that yet. It's possible that, you know, we, we still are, we're still living every day, finding out more information. Um, but for me personally, I get the flu vaccine every year. I've never had any issues getting the flu vaccine every year. And so if I have to get the COVID vaccine every year, in order for us to get, you know, our economy and, and for people to stop dying, then I will absolutely agree to do that as well. So um, I know that a lot of people, you know, who don't get the flu vaccine every year, that does sound a little bit scary, but for me, I get the flu vaccine every year. Um, so if, if I have to do a COVID vaccine every year, along with my flu vaccine, I will be fine with that. Zoe, do you have any questions for Dr. Shomo? Yeah, I do. So as I said earlier, I'm in college and I think most of us are very much looking forward to receiving the vaccine. And I know that it's far off in the future because we're quite far down on the list. But what do you think that the rollout will look like for college students? Do you anticipate schools to require or encourage vaccinations similar to how they're doing mandating testing? Well, the way vaccines are, it's hard to mandate um, it's hard to mandate vaccines. They do it with, with you know, MMR. 
measles vaccine. Um, but we we have a hard time even doing with flu vaccine. They've, they've, there's uh, like I work for University of Cincinnati and they would like for us to get it and they try to have us all get it. But if you have a reason that you don't want to get it, then you don't have to get it. So it's just one of those things for it's really hard. It's really hard to mandate people to get any vaccine. So I'm not super concerned about that. Um, they, you know, because it's just one of those things that legally it can be really hard to mandate. Um, so what they can do though, what the universities can't, could do is say that you, they can't necessarily kick people out of school if they don't get the vaccine, but they may say, they can strongly encourage basically. It's hard to mandate a lot of things, but they can strongly encourage. They may say that you can't be in dorms if, unless you get the vaccine or that you cannot attend in-person classes unless you get the vaccine. Um, so they try to at times strongly encourage people to get the vaccine, but it's, it's generally legally hard to mandate and say everybody has to get the vaccine. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, Dr. Shomo, I have one more question. I know that after getting the vaccine, you need to definitely continue to wash your hands and wear a mask and keep doing social distancing. But I've been hearing reports that now you're encouraged to wear two masks. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, that is one of the things that came out recently in the news this week. Um, it's not a CDC. Um, it's not a CDC recommendation at this time. But early on, you know, the CDC was not recommending that people wear masks at all because we were still finding out a lot of information. And I think that's what's really hard about this time. You know, this whole past year, things change constantly. Um, so that's why, you know, I try to take it day by day and try not to overthink things too much because this is just a weird situation that we're in, you know? Uh, we've never been in anything like this that we've seen. So every day information is changing and we just try to take it as, as it comes. Um, but it's very overwhelming. And one of the biggest things about the double masking is that as far as I know, there's, there's not a lot of data about it. Um, it's just one of those things where they know that there are a lot of these mutant variants. So they are saying maybe people should do what they can, you know, since we have a lot of masks now, if you, if you wear two masks, it couldn't hurt anything. Um, but it's just one of those things that we don't have enough data for the CDC to actually recommend it at this time. Definitely. Well, I have to say that was a fascinating discussion. And I want to thank all my guests for coming on the show today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Great to be a part of it. Okay, so make sure to check out all of these stories that we discussed today on our website at www.thecincinnatiherald.com. And you can also check out our print edition, which is coming out real soon. And the print edition is sold at your local Kroger, UDF, Walgreens, Joseph Beth Booksellers, and at select service stations. You can follow us at the Cincinnati Herald on Facebook, Follow us at Cincy Herald on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow us on YouTube. Just search for the Herald TV on there. And you can also follow us on our newest TikTok station. Just search for us at the Cincinnati Herald. And folks, remember to wear a mask, wash your hands, and practice social distancing. This is John Reese, digital editor of the Cincinnati Herald, and have a good night. <laughs>